Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mr. This is South America, and here is Ecuador. Now let's open the door to Ecuador, shall we? As the Ice Age began to melt and South America started to thaw, the people began stepping in, marching or canoeing down from the north and nestling into Ecuador. Ecuador is one of the very few mega-diverse nations in the world, meaning there's a lot of different plants and animals. And the first Ecuadorians seem to have eaten all of them. And to eat a pie, anyone? One of the early cultures to be born here was the Valdivia, who lived along the coast and fished and crafted rather the clever ceramics, among the oldest in the Americas. Over time, many different cultures sprouted up across the land, fighting and trading with each other, some of them practicing that strange and curious custom called artificial cranial deformation, in which young children had flat stones bound to their heads to change the shape, elongating the skull. Why? There's theories, but no certainties. In 1463, the Inca Empire of Peru began encroaching into Ecuador and conquered most of it by 1500. Many peoples of Ecuador did not like the Inca ruling over them and forcing the Quechua language onto them, and were actually happy when the Spanish arrived in the 1530s and defeated the Inca. Many Amerindians succumbed to introduced sicknesses as the Spanish set up cities and estates on which the natives toiled, and the Jesuits learned native languages and trekked deep into the Amazon to share the gospel with the natives, many of whom had the habit of collecting human heads and shrinking them. So the centuries passed and the language and culture of Spain permeated throughout Ecuador, but the love of Spain itself was not so deeply embedded in the national mindset, and Ecuador ended up joining the other colonies in fighting for independence against Spain in the early 19th century. The calls for Ecuadorian liberation began in the port city of Guayaquil in 1820, and soon spread and Spain was defeated two years later. In 1830, Ecuador was independent. Probably the best known part of Ecuador is the Galapagos Islands, that curious volcanic archipelago whose strange and wonderful animals put ideas into the head of a young Englishman named Charles Darwin as he visited the islands. Ecuador immediately underwent internal struggles. The countryside, dominated by the city of Quito, was largely conservative, and the coast, dominated by Guayaquil, was largely liberal, and they both had their various grudges, and the quarreling country's governors bickered and fought. This strong and determined face belonged to Gabriel Garcia Moreno. Years earlier, he had witnessed firsthand the dangers of liberalism in the 1848 revolutions in Europe and he would establish Ecuador's conservative party. Above all, he wanted his divided nation to be unified, which was currently fragmented by race, class, language, and politics. The one thing people had in common was Roman Catholic Christianity, and Moreno would make this one of the two focuses of his regime, the other being himself as a firm, steadfast head of state. Moreno oversaw economic improvements. Roads were paved, railways, hospitals, and schools were built, but the liberals' hatred of him was undimmed as they lambasted him in the press as a dictator, and in 1875 he was assessed by a Colombian with a machete. Even so, it took the Liberals 20 years to muster enough strength to get control, which they did in 1895 with this man, Eloy Alfaro. Secularism was encouraged, church properties were confiscated, and I'm sure it was pure coincidence they ended up in Liberal leaders' hands. Alfaro continued the building program, but he had enemies too and ended up kicked out of office and then killed by being forcibly dragged along cobbled streets before his body was burned in 1912. By the 1920s, the economy was in an abject state, not helped by a fungal infection of cocoa plants, which were the most important export. The army took control, but nothing was really solved. Oddly enough, the country began to see improvements in the middle of World War II, where rising prices and demand for its raw materials saw the country do a lot better. But Ecuador's hazy territorial claims in the Amazon were challenged by Peru, who invaded in 1941 and gobbled up a lot of land, and Ecuador's minuscule army could do nothing about it. But Ecuador never forgot this outrage, and two more conflicts would result from it. After a number of military leaders in the 1970s, this man was elected a reformer highly concerned with human rights, who died two years later in a mysterious plane crash. Ecuador's troubles persisted as presidents rose and fell without providing any solutions. In 2001, the unpopular national adoption of the US dollar actually brought some fiscal stability. The socialist Rafael Correa ushered in numerous liberal policies, and while the standard of living improved, there was recession and numerous protests, notably from Amerindian groups angered at their forest lands being sold to China. In 2012, he offered asylum to WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange something his successor Moreno revoked in 2019, leading to Assange's prompt arrest. Ecuador has a lot of difficulties ahead, but many advancements have been made and are underway, and the country has reached a high level of human development and a growing economy. So that's it for Ecuador, and that's all from me for now. Bye-bye!